Hey everybody, John King with Summit Funding. Thank you for joining me for my weekly broadcast for Financial Friday, uh, where I bring you different financial tips, whether it's financial lessons you should have learned in school or mortgage related topics or other things. I just wanna continue to be a resource to educate you and to help you to grow in your financial life. And today I wanted to talk about property taxes. So our, let me pull up my little list here. <clears throat> so our topic for today is property tax 101. Um, this is a super thorough uh, topic, and I'm going to do my best to cover it in a good amount of detail. We're going to cover a lot of information about how property taxes work, how they're calculated, how you appeal the property taxes, what dates come into play, lots of things um, critical as a homeowner that you understand a few components of this. Uh, so sit back and let me know what questions you have as you go through this. I'll be able to respond to you if you're watching live and if you're watching recorded, put the comments out there and I'll respond to you. Uh, uh, later and follow up on whatever questions you have. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and get started with how do property taxes work in the state of California? California is um, a uh, unique state in a lot of ways, including in property taxes, excuse me. <clears throat> um, and the fact that California bases property taxes on what your house was purchased for and then minor increases in that assessed value are allowed, but it's not actually reassessed to fair market value until the property is sold. And all of that goes back to Prop 13. And Prop 13 was uh, passed into law when I turned three years old, like literally on my third birthday. Happy birthday to me, uh, June 6, 1978. And Prop 13 is uh, enacted. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Prop 13 covers how property taxes are viewed. So let's go ahead and take a look at Prop 13. Oops, sorry about that. Let's take a look at Prop 13 and kind of get an overview of how it works. So here we go. And let's see if we can make this a little bit cleaner, Anna. Um, so June 6, 1978, uh, voters overwhelmingly approved Prop 13. What does it do? Um, it rolled back property taxes to 1975's value. So they basically said, hey, we're going to ignore the last three years of property tax increases. Um, and it's going to fix the price at that value with one exception that it gets to go up 2% every single year is the assessed value <clears throat> that your property taxes are allowed to increase unless the home is sold or there are significant improvements done on the home. It basically converts the property taxes from a, uh, an, a, a fair market value-based system to an acquisition value-based system. It's one of, I think it's the only state in the United States. I'm not positive about that but most states base property taxes on the, what the house is worth today. In California, property taxes are not reassessed based on what the house is worth today. They're simply reassessed based upon what the maximum is that you can have as a charge. And I'll go through that in just a moment. <clears throat> All right, um, Anna, you're gonna have to help me out here. Do I have another slide on the overview of Prop 13? I don't think so. All right, if I'm done with that, then let's go back to... <clears throat> All right, perfect. Sorry, gang, I have so much content I'm trying to cover on this one, and I want to make sure that I get to all of it. So the next thing I want to talk about really is what happens when property values go up. And that's really what I want to discuss here. Prop 13 limits the increase in property value by 2% per year from the day you initially bought the home. So your value of your home when you bought it can only be taxed at that value <clears throat> plus 2% every single year unless there is new construction on the home or a transfer in value. So that is critical. Uh, C. Ray is saying no video. Oh no, C. Ray. Uh, Anna, jump in and see. C. Ray, do you have audio? <clears throat> it sounds like you might have. You said there's no video, um, but uh, well, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, Anna, if you could dive into a couple of our of our streams and see if the video is working on those streams, I would appreciate it. Uh, this is the joy of live streaming, right? So hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, we'll just call this a podcast today. And if you have no video, then at least we'll have a podcast of audio. Uh, so here's what we've got. Um, we've got Anna saying it works on her end. See, I don't know if it's an issue with, um, uh, with LinkedIn where you're at right now or not. And I apologize, but you can check me out on Facebook, or you can check me out on YouTube, and hopefully you can see it there. So <clears throat> back to what happens when property values go up. When the value goes up, you're still assessed at your original value plus 2% per year. It does not charge you taxes on the current value of your home. 
All right. Uh, and Jen just said, yeah, we have video on Facebook. Thanks, Jen. All right. So <clears throat> what does that mean? It means that your value isn't going to skyrocket when home prices skyrocket. You brought your house in 2019 and we saw a 36% increase in home value in 2020 and 2021. Your property taxes did not go up by 36%. They could only go up by 2% per year. So <clears throat> the next question is what happens when property tax to property taxes when values decline? That's actually a more important one to understand. So oh, <clears throat> um, actually, I've got a little bit of the wrong slide here. Uh, and that's okay because we're moving pretty quickly on this one. So let me explain to you what happens. When property tax values decline, you're going to be assessed at whatever the value of the home is. And I've got a chart, hopefully, on the next slide that is going to give me a little bit better understanding. Yep. <clears throat> so I'm going to use this and I'm going to explain it to you a little bit better. So, <clears throat> excuse me, gang. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a frog in my throat. I'm going to grab some water and see if I can drown the frog. Okay, so let's go through what happens in this slide, and you'll be able to see what happens. The, the top line, the I don't know what that is, magenta, <clears throat> that line with the diamonds is the market value. And so the market value in this example, year number one, you bought the house for $450,000. That's the year you bought it, which means that not only is <clears throat> your market value, it's also the Prop 13 maximum value because there hasn't been any time for the value to, to be assessed 2% higher. And it is your actual assessed value or what you're charged property taxes on. Now, let's use this example. In year number two, the value rises from four hundred and fifty dollars to $500,000. <clears> in that case, you your property taxes did not increase to being based on a $500,000 home because it's greater than the 2% increase allowed by Prop 13. So the property taxes are assessed at $459,000 because 2% of 450 is nine grand. <clears throat> Therefore, your property tax value, the value that you're taxed on is $459,000, even though the property value went up to 500,000. But here's where most people get confused. When property values decline. So in this example, in year number three, property values declined and they're now below $400,000. Your assessed value drops right with it. <clears throat> so your assessed value fell <clears throat> and you're charged property taxes on that number of whatever the house is worth. That's pretty ex understandable. Most people have figured that part out. It's years four, five, and six in this example that confuses everybody. Because what you notice in year three, <clears throat> when the property value declined to under $400,000, the Prop 13 value stayed the same. Prop 13 is the cap or the highest they can assess your home. And it goes up 2% per year, regardless of what the home value does. So that went up by another almost $10,000 because now we're adding 2% of the 459 from year number two. <clears throat> so this is a straight line. The orange line with the circles is a straight line that you continue to get 2% increase per year. That's the thing that people misunderstand. So when you're in year three and your value dropped to $375,000, and then year four, it goes back up to $400,000. That was an increase. I guess in this case, year three was uh, 350. So in year four, the value goes up by $50,000 from 350 to 400. And that's a 12 and a half percent increase in your property tax value. And somebody screams and says, wait, I was told Prop 13 said my value can't increase by more than 2%. So you can't charge me more than 2% over the 350 that I was charged last year. That's wrong. That is the biggest myth the biggest misunderstanding of property taxes <clears throat> is the line that is the cap stays at 2% above whatever you bought the home for and keeps going up every single year. If your current market value drops below the Prop 13 value, it can go back up as quickly as the values go up until it hits that threshold. So you see in this example, year number four, years number five, and year number six, it takes until year number six, <clears throat> actually, yeah, it takes until year number six for the market value to get above the Prop 13 value. 
that's when your property tax assessment hits that cap and it no longer can go above that cap. It can only grow by 2% per year. So I'm going to say this in a really simple way to understand. When property values drop below your assessed value, your, <clears throat> excuse me, let me repeat that. When property values drop below what your Prop 13 cap was, that you're going to get the full benefit of the drop in property values. But when they come back up, you're going to go right back up to the maximum of the Prop 13 value. And it is one of the biggest misunderstandings of property taxes and how they work. So forgive me for taking so much time on that piece, but I think it's critical to thoroughly understand it when you want to pay attention to property taxes. <clears throat> Speaking of which, the second thing that's super misunderstood is the calendar and how the property tax calendar works. So I've kind of got a breakdown right now of how the property tax calendar works, and let's dive into some of the dates. First of all, January 1st is the date of valuation for the upcoming year. You need to remember that because right now in most counties, you have the opportunity to appeal the value of your home, but you're appealing it based upon what it was worth on January 1st. And that is something I want to talk about in a couple of minutes when I talk about the appeal process, but the county, the state is basing your value of your property that you're taxed on based on what it was worth on January 1st. The fiscal year for property taxes runs from July 1st to June 30th. So it's actually not a calendar year. So even though it's a little confusing that the value is based on June 1st, the value on June 1st is what they use to charge you for the upcoming July 1st to June 30th tax year. <clears throat> then sometime between May and August, letters are mailed out telling homeowners of their new assessed value. And then you have a deadline to appeal that assessed value. Now, there are 10 counties in which that deadline is September 15th. And those 10 counties are listed here. Now, the, one that, the ones that we're local to, Alameda County, Placer County, San Francisco and Santa Clara counties, <clears throat> those counties, you have only until September 15th to appeal your property taxes. And I'll talk in a couple of minutes about the appeal process. Then on October 1st, your tax bills are sent. So everybody in the last month got a copy of the property tax bill in the mail. And we're going to go over what the property tax bill looks like and give you an understanding of how to read it. But you're going to get your bill sometime in the first week or two of October. November 1st is the due date. Now, before you put in comments and scream at me, John, it's due December 10th. No, it's due November 1st. It's late December 10th. It's kind of like your mortgage payment is due on the 1st, but you don't have a past due penalty until you until after the 16th. You have a 15-day grace period to pay your mortgage every month. You have a 40-day grace period to pay your property taxes every year. So it is due November 1st. It is late on December 10th. Now, November 30th is another critical date. <clears throat> For those of you who weren't in the 10 counties that I mentioned in the last slide, you have until November 30th to appeal your value of your home. But here's the challenge. The challenge, what we're dealing with literally right now is property tax values are based upon what the home was worth on January 1st. We've seen a decrease in house prices over the last nine months, last 11 months. Yet you can't call the county and say, hey, I'm appealing my value because my house is not worth today what you're charging me. You're appealing based on what the house is worth on January 1st. So this upcoming January, they're going to reassess and send you the bill next year. And you can appeal that if you think the value is too high. Clearly, nobody wants to appeal the value if they think it's too low because that's just a win. It's kind of like Monopoly, bank error in my favor. <clears throat> this is the adult version of Monopoly in real life. So uh, November 30th, deadline to appeal your home value in every other county not mentioned above. December 10th, that is the last day to pay the first installment without a late fee. Your second installment. So they take the entire tax bill and they cut it in half. And your second installment of your property taxes is due on March 1st late on April 10th, the same 40 day uh, grace period to get it paid, you have to have your property taxes paid by April 10th. So that's really the breakdown of the dates. We'll go into, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we'll go into now how to appeal property taxes. I think that's really critical. Um, and I'll tell you that a lot of people miss this. A lot of people just make the assumption that, you know what, the taxes are what the taxes are. And there's nothing I can do about it. 
But the truth is, there's a lot that you can do about it and you need to pay attention. So the first thing I will tell you is you have to file an appeal <clears throat> by the September 15th or November 30th deadlines. Now, the beginning, uh, the first date you can file an appeal is July 2nd. So you're going to get a notice of what your home is worth sometime, like I said, between April and July. <clears throat> when you get that notice, you have to remember, this is, a, this is calculating what the county thinks my property was worth back on January 1st. And you can fight and say, I think you're wrong. I think you're valuing my property too high. And you can make that appeal starting on July 2nd. If you're in one of the 10 counties that I had mentioned earlier, then you can appeal uh, that uh, up until September 15th. Every other county you have until November 30th to appeal. But here's the deal. <clears throat> Let's dive in a little bit deeper on this. I mentioned we have the, uh, the uh, <clears throat> value of the home is based upon what it's worth now. So if you're sending in any comps, not now, value of the home is worth is based on what it's worth on January 1st. You have to make sure the comps that you're sending to argue the value of your home are comparable sales that closed in December of last year because the date of valuation is January 1st. So you can't use a comparable sale after the date of valuation. You have to use a sale from prior to the date of valuation. <clears throat> You've got to a file an assessment appeal application. There's a form number on here. You basically just go to your county assessor's office website and search for appeal property taxes. It's a simple form to fill out. Now, for an owner-occupied home, a single-family owner-occupied home, the burden of proof falls on the county to prove their calculation was correct. So if you are appealing the value of the home that you live in, that is a single-family home that you own, so single-family owner-occupied, you don't have to provide any comps. The only thing you have to do is to submit the appeal and the county has to prove that their calculation was right. So if you think they overvalued your home, you can submit an appeal. The truth is the county is kind of like Zillow. I hate to say it, but it is. And if you're a realtor on here or if you know anything about Zillow, they lost their shorts in improperly valuing homes because they bought homes that they thought were worth a certain dollar amount. They went to sell them and realized that that really isn't what they're worth. And the county can't go out and send an appraiser to everybody's home in the county every single year to check what the value is worth. It's just impossible. So they're running statistical algorithms. They're running averages. They're getting a computer to say, what is this house worth as of January 1st? And the computer is not accurate. So if you think your home was overvalued, <clears throat> all you have to do if it's a single family owner occupied property is to fill out the appeal form and let them try and prove to you that their number was right. So that makes the process super, super easy. But the reverse is true if it's not owner occupied single family. So if you live in a duplex, triplex, fourplex, or if you're trying to appeal the value of a rental property or a second home, the burden of proof falls on you at the time you submit the appeal. And you need to submit that appeal <clears throat> with comparable values that show that they overvalued your property. So a huge difference as far as how much work you have to do. It really says, look, if you look at the value and you think that you're overvalued, there's no harm in appealing the value of the home. Okay. Because if it's your owner occupied property, you don't have a lot of work to do. All right. Um, now, if the county board, so what happens is the county board reviews your appeal. And if the county board uh, agrees with your appeal, then they're going to lower your property basis. If they disagree with your appeal, <clears throat> you can take them to court. But the truth is, when you take them to court, you're only appealing the process that they followed. You're saying, hey, they didn't give me due process of law. They didn't, you know, they ignored me. They ignored my comps, whatever. You can't go to court to fight over the number. You can go to court only to fight over the process. So the truth is each county either has the board of supervisors or a specific committee, a specific board that is uh, for appeals of property tax values. They're the ultimate decision maker. You can only appeal to a higher court if you feel like they didn't follow due process of the law. So recognize they are basically the judge, jury, and executioner of this process. But here's the deal. The most important thing I have on here is the, the best advice. And I got this actually from the State Board of Equalization website. And they said, you need 
to simply pick up the phone and call your assessor's office and have an informal conversation with your assessor. And you simply say, hey, <clears throat> I don't think you guys valued my home properly. I think my home is worth less than that. Can you explain to me how you come up with these numbers? And they said, a lot of the times, the assessor's office will simply adjust the number for you without going through the formal appeal process with the Board of Supervisors. They don't want to bring a whole bunch of appeals in front of the Board of Supervisors. So if they agree that, yeah, you're right, I'm looking at the numbers and you definitely overvalued your property, the assessor has the right to make that change without going to the Board of Supervisors. So the best advice I have is A, if it's an owner-occupied property that is a single-family residence, you can do a formal appeal because you don't have to do any research. But no matter what, pick up the phone and call the assessor's office and just have a conversation and say, hey, I don't understand. And make sure that you're doing that before your county deadline. So again, in Northern California, not North Northern California, but kind of the Central Valley, um, Placer County is a big one that has a deadline of September 15th. San Francisco and Santa Clara counties have the deadline of September 15th. Most other counties in the Central Valley Bay Area um, have a deadline of November 30th. So you have about four weeks left, three and a half weeks left, uh, not including the fact that Thanksgiving is coming and Veterans Day. So if you are not in one of those counties with the September 15th deadline, you still have time to appeal your property taxes. I'd say take a look at it and see what you think. Call your local friendly realtor. They can help you run some comps. They can give you an idea of saying, hey, is my house really at that value based on January 1st. If you don't trust your realtor, um, well, you made the wrong decision because you should have a great realtor that you trust forever. But if you don't remember who your realtor is, pick up the phone and call me. I can connect you to a great realtor who can give you an idea of what the house was worth back then to help you figure out whether you should appeal that value. All right, so let's go on to um, what goes into the property taxes that I pay. And this is um, really confusing to a lot of people as far as property taxes, because Prop 13 says that your property taxes are 1% of the value of your home. So you say, John, I bought my house for $500,000, therefore my taxes are $5,000. That just isn't true, because your property taxes are based upon multiple things. It is essentially the assessed value of the home times your tax rate, which is greater than 1%, plus any special assessments. That's how it comes out to the amount that is due. But the tax rate, the base is 1% statewide, but special assessments can be added in two different ways. They can be added as a percentage of home values or as a flat dollar amount. But let me explain first, what is a special assessment? It's really, first of all, legally, it was any amounts prior to 1978, because when they enacted the Prop 13, they had to make up for all of the taxes that were the monies that were owed prior to that. But really what it is, is any bond measures that are voted on that the community said, we need these services. Now you might say, John, what the heck is a bond measure? So think about the area around your home and the services that serve your community. So we're talking about schools, we're talking about fire stations, we're talking about police stations, we're talking about lots of services that are needed and one of the things that ends up happening is the NIMBY or not in my backyard mentality. And that says, look, <clears throat> it's not my problem. I'm not going to allow that to happen to me. I'm not going to pay for the new school that's necessary for all of those people that are moving in on the other side of town. Anybody ever thought that way? Well, I'm not sure I disagree with you. I, 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 I can see where you're coming from. Let me say it that way. But what it means is that the builder of those new homes doesn't have the option to say, hey, city, can you add this to everybody's property taxes? And so instead, they have to do something called mellow ruse. Mellow ruse is just another version of special assessments, but these aren't voted on. These are bonds or money that was borrowed to pay for infrastructure, to pay for schools, additional police uh, location or fire locations, but it's also to pay for the roads that were created, the water pipes that were run underground, the utility lines that were run. Somebody had to pay for all of that. And so when a new developer buys land, they have to convert that land to livable, uh, buildable lots. <clears throat> and all of the infrastructure work that is done has to be paid for somehow. Now, the developer can just pay for it and include it in the price of the home. And that's kind of how it used to be. That's how a lot of homes were built. Hey, the developer just said, hey, 
I'm going to go ahead and include it in the price of the home. It's not a big deal. And then they realized, you know what? We could actually either A, sell the home for a little cheaper or B, make more profit on the sale of the home if we charge for all of the upgrade work that we did as part of the property taxes. This kind of reminds me of how the airline industry has gone. Don't y'all remember the days when you used to be able to get on a plane and you could pick your seat and you could bring on some luggage and you could get food and it was all included in the price. And then the airlines realized, well, wait a second, I can charge extra for that. I can separate that from the price of the airline ticket. Now, maybe that meant they lowered the price of the ticket. Maybe it meant they're just making more profits because they don't have to pay for those things as part of the price of the ticket. But now you pay for all of those things separately. That's what developers are now doing is they're saying, you know what? I'm going to charge the homeowner for the future homeowners for all of the infrastructure work that we did on the home. Thank you for that, for that thumbs up, Janet. Um, that's exactly what's happening. And they're charging the future homeowners. Tip, a lot of these are 20 and 30 year bonds, meaning that for the next 20 or 30 years, every homeowner is paying back as part of their property taxes for the roads and the schools and the utility and the sewer and all of that stuff. Now, some builders say, you know what? We have no Melarus. What that means is the builder paid it off and they're using that as a marketing tool. They're typically charging more for the home. It's no different than Southwest that says bags fly free. It's a marketing tool. Now, one can argue they don't charge more for their ticket, but it's all, they're making their money one way or the other. So just understand that's all thrown into your property taxes. There are city and county wide assessments that can be voted on, but there's also Melarus, which are not voted on. They're simply put in place by the developer when they're building out the land to make them buildable lots. And they're passing that cost on to future homeowners. All right, so let's dive into another topic and let's talk about how do I read my property tax bill? Now, the first thing I'll tell you is every county looks a little bit different. I'm using Placer County as an example because they had an easy one on their website. And so um, uh, you can all see these spots are numbered on here. Uh, number one talks about what year this is for. So that's critical to understand what year this is for. Um, all right, so hold on, I got a question here. So let's close this out. And uh, that's okay, Mellow Roos. Uh, I think it's M-E-L-L-O-R-O-O-S. I, I know you said you didn't know how to spell it and that's okay, I, nobody does. Um, anyway, Mellow Roos do end in most cases because it's a repayment of a loan. It's kind of like your mortgage, you pay it for 30 years and then the mortgage is paid off. And Mellow Roos are a payment. Did you get it better for me, Kathy? Uh, Mellow Roos, okay, I don't know. Honestly, we could all guess. If I could get everybody to put their version of how you spell Melarus, that would be awesome. I think we're all going to have a different version. Anyway, so Melarus are, um, okay, now, now Kathy's got a different version of Melarus. Anyway, I don't know that anybody's right. The fact is Melarus are typically a fixed money amount of money borrowed for a fixed period of time. And so that, at a, that will end at a certain point you've got to read your property tax bill. All right, Randy tells me uh, it's Mellow Roos, which is a little different. So is there any at the end or not? How many O's and how many L's? M-I-S-S-I, S-S-I, 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 P-P-I? I'm just kidding. Anyway, it is definitely a tongue twister, but the fact of the matter is um, that's a great question and I really appreciate you putting that question out there for me. Randy, let's get rid of your comment. Let's go back to where we were. And we're talking about how to read the property tax bill. All right. So Anna, let's pull up the property tax bill again. Um, spot number two. This is critical. Read on the top left corner. If it is a duplicate bill, it will say duplicate bill. The original was sent to your lender. Um, Randy, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, actually, Kathy did. Kathy Googled it. She got the exact spelling. I'll cover that in a second. All right. So... Um, the, the lender only gets a copy of your taxes if there is a, a comment in section number two, top left corner of your bill, that says duplicate bill, original was sent to your lender. Watch for that. If it says that, you don't need to call me or your lender to ask, did you get my property tax bill? If it doesn't say that, you need to call me and your lender or your servicer to confirm we got the tax bill. Okay. Contact information, section number three for your, for your uh, county tax collector. Number four is your parcel number. Here's the deal. I have seen people end up paying taxes for somebody else's home for years. 
And you need to kind of pay attention to this. Check it every once in a while. Check it once. Go back to your original paperwork from when you bought the home. Your parcel number is printed. It's called your APN and it's printed on your deed. You've got right next to that is the property address and the owner's name. So five and six, which can be very different than number seven. So uh, it's funny. This is actually used. Property tax information is used by marketers to find homes that are tenant occupied. So if you ever get uh, mail at your home that says, uh, you know, hey, I know you're renting. It's likely because the address that your property taxes are mailed to is different than the address of the, of the subject property of the actual home, because most landlords don't have the property taxes mailed to the home that they own. They have it mailed to where they live or they have it mailed to their business. Uh, again, just real basic information. We're going to go to the middle section of the tax bill. This is the critical part. So section number eight, top left corner, and it's telling you how is the home value broken out? So you've got what is the what is the opinion of the county on what the land is worth? What is the opinion of the county of what your structural improvements are worth? And then they subtract your homeowner's exemption, which I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes. And that comes out to spot number 10, your net taxable value. Your net taxable value is the amount of money that your property taxes are based on. So that number before the homeowner's exemption is what you're comparing to say, hey, guys, I think you're off on my home value. I don't think it's valued properly. And then you've got spot number 11, which is your tax rate. And then you've got over here on the far right side, some contact information. Um, and it's basically saying, hey, We've got your value of your home times the base 1% because statewide you pay 1% no matter what. So that's spot number 11. And then number 14 is what is the grand total? So in this case, uh, the property value is uh, 358,000, I'm sorry, $35,800. And therefore the bill is, the base bill is $358. Then you got section 15. These are what it says right there, voter approved taxes, taxing agency and direct charges and special assessments. This is where it gets tricky. This is where you're going to look at all of the little line items. Sometimes people will say, hey, John, I understood that my garbage bill is included in my property taxes. You'd see it right there. Some people will say, hey, I've got um, uh, I, I did a pace loan where I borrowed money and they put it on property taxes. You'd see it right there in that section where it's talking about direct charges, special assessments, voter approved bonds. All of that is the mishmash of things. Some property tax bills are short. They have one or two lines. Some are two pages worth of lines. So your Melarus are going to show up there. Everything is going to show up right there so that you can look and see exactly what you're paying and why and how much the grand total is. And then we get to the bottom section. So we've got what the grand total of your taxes are, but it's kind of confusing. It looks backwards because the next thing on there is your second tax bill. Um, and, your, and then below that is your first bill because what they expect is, hey, you're going to tear off the bottom one first and mail it in. Then you're going to tear off the top one and mail it in. But that is only half of the bill because they're splitting up the total bill in half. All right, so let's go back here real quick on a couple of things. First of all, Kathy wins the prize. Uh, she figured out how to spell Melarus correctly. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that, Kathy. Um, and Randy brought up property taxes. His water bill was in his taxes and is in his taxes until the new meters come. So that's a great example where certain municipalities, certain districts within each, even the same city, you might have a water bill mailed in one municipality, one district, and you might have the water bill included in your property taxes. You're going to see it in that line item, which means if you pay your taxes yourself, you're paying it twice a year. By the way, the county's happy to take all your money up front. So if you want to write a check uh, by December 10th for both installments, you're done. Some people do that. There's actually a tax advantage to doing that. Now, this all comes down into what year you made more money and how much money you expect to make next year. But talk to your CPA. Sometimes... If you know you're having a really good year this year and you think next year you're not going to have as much income, maybe you're retiring, prepay your property taxes. Now, there's a cap on how much you could write off in property taxes. And so there's a whole, it's a whole industry called certified public accountants and tax preparers who are experts in this stuff. 
but there's times when it makes sense to prepay your full tax bill this year, you're stealing money that you can't write off next year now because you normally paid it in the following year. But there's value in playing games with that a little bit. So be aware of that. So let's dive into the homeowner's exemption. What the heck is a homeowner's exemption and should I do it? I get this question a fair amount, but nowhere near enough. What do I mean by nowhere near enough? Because more people should be doing the homeowner's exemption and they're just not. So let me explain this. First of all, the constitution requires a $7,000 reduction of taxable value for owner occupied homes when they are the owner's principal place of residence. Now I find it funny because I copied this directly from the state board of equalization website. Um, they, they said the same thing twice. Owner occupied home when the home are, uh, when the homes are the owner's principal place of residence, which is the definition of owner occupied. So therefore rentals and vacation homes don't qualify. Um, I don't think you care, I don't care, but the state reimburses the county for the lost money. Congratulations county, you didn't lose anything, but here's how much it saves you. You are decreasing the net taxable value by $7,000 every year. Now what that means on an average bill, remember I said the base is 1% and you have a whole bunch of special assessments that are added. So we don't know how much extra it's gonna be. So when I pre-approve somebody, I'm using one and a quarter percent as a ballpark number for a how much I'm allocating for property tax payments for them in the future. And so for that person, um, if you are at one and a quarter percent average, that means that you're saving $87.50 a year off of your tax bill. So about what, $7 a month that you're saving off of your off of your property taxes. But guess what? That's a free coffee every single month that you get. It's funny how, <laughs> I find it hilarious, how people will talk about, you know, if you just skip paying, buying a cup of coffee, you can save a whole bunch of money. That's true. But those same people are like, oh my God, I'm not going to file this form. It's only saving me $7 a month. A penny saved is a penny earned, like kind of the same thing. So there is zero cost. There is zero negative to having a homeowner's exemption. So grab your property tax bill. You got it in the mail in the last month. Grab your property tax bill. Look in the top section of the property tax bill. I'm going to show you right here where that's at. Anna, can we add that in instead? Thank you very much. So right here in the middle, let's make that a lot bigger. So right up here, section number nine, land structural improvements and homeowner's exemption. If you don't have a homeowner's exemption listed there of $7,000, you are leaving money in the coffers of the state that they are happy to give back to you. So go on to the county assessor's website and download the form to request a homeowner's exemption. You can only have it on one property because guess what? You can only have one owner occupied property. You can't occupy two homes. The other home is your second home because one of them you're occupying more than 50% of the time. The other one, you are not. All right. So speaking of homeowner values and exemptions, uh, there is a very big exemption for uh, disabled veterans. And so I want to explain this to you. Here's the first thing I'll tell you. The exemption, whether it be the homeowner's exemption or the exemption for disabled veterans, that exemption is applied after you purchase the home. So I cannot take that into account at the time I'm pre-approving you. Now, the homeowner's exemption is super small, but the exemption for a disabled veteran, pretty big. So that can make a huge difference in your property taxes, yet I cannot give you credit for that. I cannot set up your mortgage or approve your mortgage and have your payment based upon what the taxes are going to be changed to because we have no way of guaranteeing that the county that you're eligible and the county is going to apply that for you. So it's a catch-up provision. Just be aware of that fact that it'll be caught up later, but you cannot apply it immediately. All right, so the disabled veterans exemption reduces the tax liability on a principal residence for qualified veterans who, due to a service-connected injury or disease, have been rated 100% disabled or being compensated at the 100% rate. Also, the unmarried spouse of a qualified veteran, surviving spouse uh, of a qualified veteran, um, is also eligible for the exemption. Two different levels of the exemption. So there's the basic, what's called the $100,000 exemption, Everybody qualifies for that. And the cool thing is it's inflation adjusted. Now, the last numbers I could find were from back in 2018, but it means that a, a disabled veteran, every disabled veteran 
has the ability in 2018 to take $134,000 off of the taxable value of your home. That's huge. That's a, a, about $1,500 a year, or what are we talking about? $125 a month off of your monthly payment. So that is a significant amount of savings. And then if you qualify under the income thresholds, it's uh, even greater. You have a bigger amount. In 2018, it was actually $202,000, but you had to make less than $60,000 as a family. So the disabled veteran tax deduction, if you are a disabled veteran, first of all, thank you for your services, uh, for your service to our country. Um, you deserve this. And if you're not taking advantage of it, you should reach out to the county and apply for the disabled veteran tax exemption. At the very least, you're going to save a hundred and some odd thousand dollars off of the taxable value of your home. All right. So let's see where we're we going to next. Ooh, this is a fun one. This one I get all the time. And that is, what is a supplemental tax bill? Let me tell you, this is the, probably the most confusing thing that happens. Everybody who buys the home gets a supplemental tax bill and nobody understands how it works. So this is something I'm going to camp out on and spend a little bit of time on so that you can understand better what a supplemental tax bill is. So first of all, it updates the tax bill based on the data transfer. We all know that Prop 13 said your taxes can only go up 2% per year unless there is new construction on the property or if there's a change in ownership. The problem is the counties don't have enough staff to be on top of the change in ownership right away. But even if they did, the change in ownership almost never happens coinciding with the actual date that the tax bill was created. And so you have a disparity. You have an amount of money that was charged to you or, well, that was charged to you on the tax bill that is either higher or lower than what you should have been charged. And the supplemental bill makes up for that. Remember, property tax bills are set in advance. They're based on the tax year from July 1st through June 30th. And so if you buy a home on July 30th, so we're one month into the tax year, you've got, and, and by the way, let's say the seller of the home had a very low value then that bill that was created for that year was based on the seller's value. Yet for 11 months of that year, you owned the home and you owe taxes at your higher amount. But the original bill is never going to be recreated. The supplemental bill adjusts for that. It says, hey, they owned it and it was assessed at 100000 You're buying it for 700000 There's a $600,000 difference we're going to charge you for. That is what the supplemental bill does. So there might be two supplemental bills. For example, if you bought the home on May 31st, 30 days has September, April, June, and November. Yes, May 3rd, there are 31 days. I still sing the song. Anyway, there are 31 days in May. Raise your hand if you still sing the song. I hope I'm not the only one that just embarrassed myself. Anyway, um, and I'm happy to embarrass myself. So the fact is you bought your home on May 31st. One month of that tax year, you have to pay the higher tax amount. But the truth is the tax bill that starts on July 1st has already been created and is in process. They don't have the time to correct that bill to your new value there. And they don't have the manpower to even have caught it by the time that came out. So you're going to get one supplemental bill for the end of the prior tax year and another supplemental bill covering the new tax year because they have to make up the difference from the day that you purchased the home. So let's dive into an example here. Let's make this one a little bit bigger. So what you've got is, um, let's pretend that the correct tax bill is $6,000 or $500 a month. The prior owner's tax bill was only $1,200 or hundred bucks a month. So the supplemental bill is sent to you for the $4,800. That's the difference between the prior owner's tax bill and yours. Now it is prorated based on the number of days that you were the owner. And so understanding that you're not, if you own the home only for two months out of that 12, then they're adding only 60 days or 72 days of however much time that you owned the home. But that's how the supplemental bill is managed. All right. So let's talk about, will my lender pay my supplemental tax bill? Here's the deal with supplemental tax bills. A supplemental bill in every other state is a bill for other personal property. So when you call your lender and you say, hey, I got my supplemental tax bill, I'm going to send it to you. The first thing they say is, nope, I'm not paying your supplemental tax bill. 
And you're like, well, wait a second, but it's part of my taxes. No, supplemental bills are your responsibility. Now, you can take that as an answer. It's not true, but you can take that as an answer and you can pay the bill and everything is hunky-dory and you will get a refund for the money that we had collected into your impound account because we, if done right, if you do your loan with me, I'm doing it right. We're collecting enough money up front to cover what your actual taxes will be. We're not covering it. We're not collecting based on what the old owner's taxes were. We're collecting based on what the total amount of property taxes are supposed to be. So we have enough money in your impound account to pay for this. Okay. So the deal though, is the lender is not mailed the bill. So when I showed you the property tax bill example a little bit ago, I showed you the fact that in there, it says on the top left corner, if the bill was mailed to your lender, supplemental bills are never mailed to your lender. So you have to make a choice. You either can pay the bill yourself or you can ask your lender to pay for it. But just be aware, your lender should have enough money to pay for this unless your escrow has been reanalyzed. And I'm going to now kind of talk about what an escrow analysis is, because the truth is I get this question all the time from people. And the funny thing is I never get a phone call when this happens, when somebody gets a letter in the mail that says, Hey, your payments dropped and here's a big check. Nobody ever calls me and says, John, why did this happen? But the funny thing is, is that when that happens, it almost always is going to be a year later that the opposite is going to happen. So let me explain to you what's going on. First of all, you got a big check and your payment was lowered because in escrow analysis, we are required by federal law to not keep more of your money than we need. Let me say that again. Lenders are required by federal law not to keep more of your money than we need. So when we receive bills for homeowners insurance, property taxes, flood insurance, whatever goes into your escrow account, if after a one year period, we have not done an analysis, we must do one. Every 12 months, we have to analyze your account because by federal law, if we have more money in the account than we've received bills for, we must refund you back the excess and lower your mortgage payment to match the bills that we've received. That sounds super logical. Why would you want the bank to keep your money when they don't need it? Well, here's why. So let's dive in a little bit deeper on this and understand it. Typically, the escrow analysis was done without seeing all of your bills. And that's usually because the supplemental bill either has not yet been sent out or um, it was paid by the owner. Now you'd say, John, why would a supplemental bill not be sent out? Because some counties are taking anywhere from nine to 24 months. Now the backlogs have been shortened a lot, but when there were a lot of transactions happening, it was taking sometimes a year to two years for the county to simply process every change in ownership and then backdate and send the supplemental bill. So if we didn't get your supplemental bill in the year between when you bought the house and when we had to analyze, then you've overpaid us. <laughs> Here's the deal. This is bad, bad, bad. I always joke with people um, when they call me the second year and explain what happened in the second year. And I say, well, did you get a, did you get a check a year ago? Hmm, I don't know. And I said, well, do you have a brand new TV on your wall that you bought about a year ago? And I get a lot of chuck a lot of that. And the truth is, oh yeah, I did get a big chunk of money. And I did do something with that. Why? Well, here's why. This is a little bit small, but I'll walk through this. Here's likely what happened. First of all, I'm going to use the same example I used earlier. The correct bill at the time of purchase was $6,000 or $500 a month. And I created your impound account to collect $500 a month for your taxes. Now, the prior owner's bill was only $1,200 or $100 a month. And at the end of the year, the lenders only received the bill from the prior owner's assessed value. So the only thing the lender paid out in step four is the $1,200. And we have an extra $4,800, an extra $4,800 sitting in the escrow account. And during, and then we do an analysis. And on step five, we refund the $4,800 and we lower your payment by $400 a month. Let me tell you, nobody ever calls me and complains about that because you just got a check for five grand and you just lowered your payment by 400 bucks a month. And man, John's amazing. He said it was a fixed rate. And as a matter of fact, it got better. Well, call me when that happens because there's no such thing as a free lunch. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. How many ever added, how many other adages that our parents tell us? These are the times when those adages come into play. So now here's what happens. We play along hunky-dory. By the way, sometimes what happened is the, the owner just paid their own supplemental bill. 
but it means we refunded you back the money that, you, that we paid because you wrote the check for the 4,800, you got your money back. The problem is we still lowered your payments by $400 a month because we didn't know that you paid the supplemental bill because we never got a copy of that bill. So step number six, during the second year, the lender gets the bill for the full amount of taxes and we pay the bill for six grand. But mind you, we only have $100 a month going into the account. So if we're collecting $100 a month into your property tax account and we get a bill for $6,000, we only had 1200 bucks. We're going to pay the bill. Your lender will always pay the amount of your property taxes and homeowners insurance, no matter if we have enough money in there or not. But then what will happen is at the end of that year, we're going to reassess again. Step number seven, the end of the second year, the escrow account only had $1,200 in there for taxes, but we paid out six grand. So we are short by $4,800, which is actually the exact amount that you got back uh, at the first analysis. So now your analysis will bump the payment back up to where it belongs because it says, hey, future taxes are actually $6,000 a year. So the county, excuse me, the, the, the lender says, okay, cool. We lowered your payment last year by 400 bucks. We realized that you're actually paying $6,000 a year in taxes. So we got to raise it back up to the normal amount. That's fine. Nobody has a problem with that. The problem is, is that that's the amount we're going to be collecting going forward for the future year. We're still owed the 4,800 bucks extra that we paid in the prior year. So what's going to happen? And everybody freaks out about this. This is the phone call I get every year on the second anniversary of owning a home where somebody is given the option by the bank that says, hey, you're now $4,800 short. You're going to see this right here in step number nine. You're $4,800 short. And so you have two choices. You can either write a check to us for $4,800 or we can add an extra $400 a month to your monthly payment. Now that's 400 on top of the 400 we just added. So let me make this really clear. Your property tax amount of your payment was supposed to be 500 bucks. And I collected the 500 bucks from the beginning. At the end of the first year, you got a bank error in your favor and we lowered it down to 100. And you're super happy about that. At the end of the second year, we say, oh, wait, no, we realize it's supposed to be at the 500 bucks it was supposed to be. Okay, you're fine with that. Except we got to raise it up to $900 for the next 12 months to make up for the 12 months we collected $400 too little. That's what freaks everybody out. That's what makes everybody mad at me and say, John, you ruined my loan. You ruined my life. I can't afford to pay this money back. Well, first of all, I'm educating people early on in the process. Matter of fact, this section of this video, I'm, I'm chopping up and sending to every single home buyer once they close escrow with me. And then I'm sending it again on their one and two year anniversary. I suggest you do the same thing because this is critical to understand how the supplemental tax bills play out and how it's going to impact you. So when you get that big check at the end of the first year, you've got to pay attention and call me so I can help you get it set up correctly. What ultimately you have to do is you have to tell your lender, hey guys, I paid my supplementals myself. I know you want to lower my payment, but I'm giving you permission to keep it where it was because I know that's the correct amount that I'm going to have to pay. Any false reduction that they give you in monthly payment has to get paid back later. You're not going to get free money. So be aware that's a big mistake a lot of people misunderstand, a lot of people make. All right, so uh, let's go to, do I have to include taxes in my mortgage? You don't, as long as you're doing a conventional loan with at least 10% down. If you're putting less than 10% down on a conventional loan, or if you're taking out an FHA, VA, or USDA loan, you must include property taxes in your payment. You don't have an option. What's a PACE loan and how does that show up on my tax bill? A PACE loan is a property assessed clean energy loan. You're borrowing the money to upgrade the energy efficiency of your home. It's a large payment and it creates a delayed effect because your PACE loan, same thing with the supplemental bill and how, hey, we billed you for it and we paid it, but now we're short. The same thing's going to happen. When you take out a PACE loan, your bank might have just analyzed your loan a month ago, which means they're not going to analyze again for 11 months which means your property taxes didn't go up for 11 months and your mortgage payment didn't change. But now you're a year behind all the amount. So if you choose to take out a PACE loan, talk to me before you do it, but make sure you're talking to the bank to make sure that they can bump your property taxes immediately. All right, so I wanna go in in the last five minutes and talk about Prop 19. 
I think this deserves a whole nother hour. Prop 19 is super confusing. I'm going to give a super high level on Prop 19, um, just as a way to close this out. Prop 19 was passed, I don't know, uh, when was it passed? I think it was 2020. Yeah, I think it was 2020. And basically what it said is homeowners have the ability who are 55 years and older or severely disabled or victims of a government declared disaster area to transfer their tax basis from one home to another in California. Now, three things. There's no time. There's no um, value limit. So you can increase or, or decrease um, your, your property taxes uh, and transfer that with you. There's no location limit. So you can move it anywhere in the state. There was a version before this that only participating counties could use. Prop 19 says any county. So if you're over 55 years old and you've owned a home for a while and you have a low tax basis, you absolutely want to file a Prop 19 claim so that you can have your taxes based upon what your prior home was worth. And you can do it up to three times, not just once. And there's no limit for people who are, who are uh, victims of a government declared disaster, governor declared disaster area. So those are all the good things about Prop 19 and how it works. And I'll explain to you a little bit about the numbers. So here's an example. If the original home that you sell, you sold for $500,000 and you're buying a new home for $700,000, the house that you're selling had a tax basis of $250,000. Now, you bought a home $200,000 more expensive than the one that you sold. They're not going to allow you to keep your tax basis at what your old basis was. But what they're going to do is they're going to take the original tax basis of $250,000 and add to that how much your home value went up. So if you bought a $200,000 larger home, then your property tax basis goes up from $250 to $450. That's way better than the old rule where you had to pay at the $700,000. It's basically saving you $3,000 a year. So that is really, really good. Now, Prop 19 has some other rules and it talks about um, how taxes are reassessed when transferring from a parent to a child and Prop 19 changed that significantly. So let's go ahead and take a look at how Prop 19 impacts moving a property from parent to child. First of all, it eliminates or reduces certain inheritance benefits. So it used to be that any home transferred from parent to child, any home, transferred from parent to child or child to parent or grandparent to child, grandchild or grandchild to grandparent was exempt no matter what. Now it's only your owner occupied property. It is only allowed on your primary residence if the person who's inheriting the property is moving into it and it's only up to $1 million. Now you might think a million dollars is a lot of money. Yeah, not really, especially in your high cost counties where somebody bought a home in Alameda County for $50,000 in 1970s, and now it's worth $3 million. You have a $2.95 million increase in the value of that home. You can only exclude 1 million of that, which means they're going to increase your tax basis up to a, a, a very significant amount. As a matter of fact, I think I have that number here. So let's look at what that example looks like. If you, uh, so family has a home currently assessed for $50,000, um, and it's inherited by somebody who's not going to live at the home, they're getting reassessed at $750,000 and it's raising their property taxes from $600 to $9,000. Okay. Huge impact. Here's an example from parent to child. So we've got the cash value of the primary residence was $750,000 and the existing basis for property taxes is $300,000. And so in this case, there was not more than a million dollar increase. So as long as the child who receives the inherited property is, or transferred property is going to be um, living in that property, then they get the original tax basis. But in this example, their property is inheriting is $1.5 million and the basis is $250,000. That's a $1.25 million increase. And the limit is only allowed for $1 million. And so you're going to have an increase in the property taxes. Um, so guys, this is super uh, confusing, super 
uh, volatile, uh, challenging. I don't know how else to put it, but I'm just about out of time. Kathy had a question. If anybody else has questions, feel free to post them. I'll do my best to answer them. Kathy said, so is this a new tax that they didn't used to do? No, it's not a new tax. What's happening is they, the assessor would never reassess the value if the transfer of ownership was from parent to child or vice versa, or from grandparent to grandchild or vice versa. Now what they're saying is, we're going to limit when we apply that. Here's what happens with any tax savings. The government votes and says, hey, or the, the legislator says, hey, we're going to give you a tax savings over here, but we got to pay for it. So we're going to we're going to take away some tax savings over here. So what they've allowed is everybody can transfer their property taxes if you're over 55 years old, regardless of what county. But the coffers still need to get the money. So what they're doing is they're harming the people who own lots of real estate. You no longer, if you own more than just your primary home under this new tax law, when you transfer those homes, when you pass away and your children inherit those properties, every one of the properties except the one they move into, which they might not move into any, but every other home is reassessed at current market value for the purpose of property taxes. Now, you need to talk to a CPA because there's an argument that says, well, if I transfer the property before I pass away, then I've got some differences in how Prop 13 and Prop 19 work, but now I don't get the stepped up tax basis from the IRS for capital gains. And if I wait until I pass away to transfer the ownership, I get some stepped up tax basis, but I also now have to have the property reassessed to the fair market value for property taxes. If the kids aren't keeping the home, who cares? But if the kids are keeping the home, then it's going to impact them. So yeah, as Kathy says, uh, rents go up, no doubt, absolutely. So it's just something to be aware of. Ka uh, Rosemary, I appreciate uh, you you giving me the kudos. Um, gang, I really appreciate all of you listening. I know this was a lot, but this is a big topic. Um, and I think I, sh I did a pretty good job, I think, of diving deep, as deep as reasonable for how challenging this topic is. I appreciate all of you and your time today. Uh, please like, share. If you like this information, share it with everybody you know. This is one of the videos that I think is critical for us to get the word out to everybody you know, whether you're a homeowner or a renter, understanding how property taxes work if you're going to be a future homeowner or a current homeowner, it's critical. So thanks for joining. Have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you all soon. Have a good day.